Hey everyone, thanks for joining here. We're going to get started with uh, the year 2024. Got a little bit of a slow start for the channel this year due to some uh, personal matters, health and otherwise. Uh, <laughs> definitely wanted to make some content, but um, just wasn't uh, wasn't in the cards. So we're going to get right into it. I am going to um, make a just a quick announcement here for the channel. I'm going to move away coming into this year. I'm going to move away from daily market internal reviews and uh, still be reviewing the internals, but not uh, not daily, not Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like I was doing towards the end of the month. I'm going to start backing off and uh, giving room for some other content, some other ideas that I have <clears throat> and uh, take them into more of a like a weekly overview. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be releasing them on Monday for the week past or uh, and then as well as potential ideas going into uh, that week starting that Monday or if I'm going to release them on Friday, it'll still effectively be the same content, um, just a slightly different schedule. So I'm going to try to do this on a weekly basis and we'll kind of see how it goes. Obviously, your feedback is uh, critical for kind of the development of this channel and where I go and what I cover. So if at any time you have a, an opinion on what I'm doing, feel free to share it in the comments. Okay, so this year we've uh, had quite a quite an interesting start. We came out of December with a little bit of a, a drawdown and now towards the end of January, we're heading into uh, all-time highs. So lots of things have occurred. The uh, Fed is in a blackout period. Market has started to uh, price in less of a <clears throat> rate decrease. So FOMC is coming up um, rather soon, and Jerome Powell will be speaking on rate hikes or or you know any of the rate decisions <clears throat> uh, but until that time uh, the big things that we've had so far are some uh, financial earnings and we've also had uh, or will be having this week uh, the, the big tech earnings so lots of stuff coming in uh, that way if we look at the econ calendar heading into you know tomorrow we've got um jolts which usually has pretty high impact we also will have uh gosh we had some other things to do uh yeah chicago pmi which can have some impact yeah so here is the fed interest rate decision so that'll be on the 31st so that's coming up this week last week of january and we've had a, a you know round of bond uh, bill auctions and, and different things that have impacted the market in different ways. And we've hit this period where the market's not really moving a whole lot. So if you follow me on X, I kind of called for potentially some kind of a pullback at this point based on various things that I look at. Wednesday, I had effectively decided the, uh, the weekly high was in uh, for this week. And um, there's a handful of reasons why that is, but I've covered it a while, a while back um, on this channel that when, you know, when the week is, is about halfway through, Tuesday, Wednesday, the, the high or low is typically in. So they did kind of surprise here Friday. We pushed right up into that 489.99 and made just a smidge of a new high on Friday and we we never really did have that big down move so Wednesday's low was never breached for the remainder of this week and I think that kind of is indicative of the tone the market is taking the market knows there's uh, NFP the market knows there's interest rate the market knows that there's a crap ton of big tech uh, big tech earnings coming in so I think there's um, there's a handful of the market that is waiting. You know, they've already positioned either from lows or they're positioning here at highs, um, hedging, you know, whatever. And so we we kind of have this um, squeeze constriction event. The VIX is still quite low, but SPY 
although it has obviously made new high, it's it's not really <clears throat> made, you know, continually new highs. So I don't know that I would call this a, a breakout uh, where we're just going to continue to rise uh, just yet. I think there's still many things on the horizon here that uh, need to be settled up <clears throat> before anything else occurs. So one thing I do want to visit is I have made a video uh, last year on the TWAP indicator and the, what I like to call the break and retest strategy. And, you know, the break and retest strategy, so I wrote an indicator that kind of helps highlight those trades for me is where we break above, come back, and break back out again. And that's where you see this. And I like to only follow those trades when we're kind of in that full alignment between the New York Stock Exchange. So trend is up uh, on the price and the volume. And away we go, right? Well, here lately, I've noticed that um, that's, you know, not been so much the case. And I don't know <clears throat> if it's because we're not really in a, uh, a trending market here coming into the new year. So there's a handful of other statistical kind of measurements, initial balance, or uh, that I've been looking at, and they have been consistently violated starting this year uh, starting this year so there's certainly something happening and i just wanted to be fully transparent that if you are looking at that strategy and maybe you've tried to implement it please do exercise caution with any strategy when using them in the markets uh, and always you know safeguard your exposure because things change all the time what worked you know even one week might not work the next one month year you name it so different year, potentially different market. We did have a couple of TWAP uh, break and retests that, that worked well. So look here, we got this one uh, on, was this Monday? No, last Friday. Well, Friday the 19th, not last Friday, two Fridays ago. And I like to see two standard deviations of delivery. And that's what I consider pretty much when the trade is, when the price is probably not going to move much more. And you can see they actually went I don't have enough deviations up here, but I'm pretty sure the projection was at least three, if not four, standard deviations from a prior range. So almost five bucks at the very high. Very good move, right? But then you come into uh, next Monday, and I mean, this one triggered, but no full alignment, so no trade. So that one's fine. Here we got a couple of shorts. I don't usually take them in the morning. This short, you know, maybe you grabbed a little bit of something. But overall, mostly kind of just chop. This one, I'm going to call that a break even, maybe even a fail. Um, this one fully aligned and then immediately rejected. <laughs> so like I said, it's just been a different market right now. I'm also seeing a ton of uh, Q and SPY divergence. So heading into a fresh open, I'll sit there in my my multi-chart layout here with all the different monthly TWAPs and I will watch the cues come down while the spy will head up and it's it's candle by candle so I'm looking at two minute candles it's a little bit difficult to see in hindsight you kind of have to see it while the candles are live and while the market is moving it, it is so bizarre to me how I come in here later and it's like uh, they didn't really look that diverged now like when i look at them but you, you can kind of see a small example of it like here the first candle in cues came down first candle in spy was a was a bullish candle um and yeah it, it is it's a little bit difficult to point it out in hindsight but you just have to take my word for it you can watch it yourself um looking for their reactions to like the first 15 minutes range which is often called the opening range there's so many interesting interactions where the cues will just dump and the spy will push up and they'll you know fight each other for sometimes half an hour or more. Obviously, the Dow and the Russ can diverge between themselves and all the other indices. I don't necessarily track that. I mean, when all these indices are going together, that's great. Uh, another thing to point out, um, I published some indicator updates to MIT. And I've had a couple of people reach out and and tell me that I've uh, you know changed it and they're no longer receiving the same signals they were before. While I did make an adjustment to 
the uh, NASDAQ implementation for MIT. The NYSE is completely the same. I did not change any of the measurements behind it. None of that has been changed. The main thing that happened was um, I made a, an adjustment here so you can turn off a lot of these plots if you'd like. And then also I, I made the adjustment where you can have your add and vold set up as ratios versus the raw numbers. And, and primarily that was because the volume value, if you've watched this channel for any amount of time, the volume value is is hilariously massive. I mean, it's hundreds of billions. <laughs> it's a little bit unusable if you can't memorize the values that I have you know described on this channel and and cover all the time. So using a, a ratio of one point seven to one through three, four, five to one makes a lot more sense for for the ad. I actually still like the raw value. It's a pretty small number to work with in my head. And I know a thousand stocks uh, in advancement or decline is either bullish or bearish. 1500 is really bearish, uh, bullish or negative. 1500 is really bearish. 2000 is, you know, look out if it's sustained. So that doesn't bother me. But I just want to cover that on the channel for anybody that's watching. Uh, I did not change the trend formula or anything else if you're using New York Stock Exchange. If you're using the NASDAQ, I did change trend. Nothing else changed. So I have reached out to some of those people that have commented at me to ask me to change it back to the old way um, because they think something has occurred. The, and so far, you know, I've submitted before and after because I obviously have the old version still, and they look exactly the same. Pick any day, they look exactly the same because I didn't change the formulas. <laughs> that being said... I did want to call out that here lately, the New York Stock Exchange, the, in the basket of stocks that it tracks, <clears throat> the, uh, the NYA and all the market internals, they have been so far diverged from what the SPY and the Qs are doing. So I'm going to chalk that up primarily to the top holdings, which is why I have this other indicator here that came out of discussion with uh, some other people that I trade with. You can adjust all these if you'd like. Um, you know, you'll have to come in here at some point because I'm sure the top holdings will be adjusted and I'm not going to be able to update this indicator all the time. But my point is you want to obviously always look at, if you're a believer of market internals anyways, the New York market and pay attention to the sentiment bands of price and volume, especially the tick, because you can see all of these peaks on tick our peaks on SPY, and it's you know it's not much different from Q's. They obviously have their own internals and kind of do their own thing sometimes, but still, betting on New York market to impact whatever it is you're trading is the safest bet. So I still always recommend having this up, but definitely, you know, in last year's time, it was wait for the trend to show white dots or... <laughs> Uh, pink in my in my color schemes case, uh, you know, wait for the bands perhaps or the trend uh, on price and volume to show bullishness if you want to go long or bearishness if you want to go short. Right now it's ugh, it's rough, you know, waiting for all that. You might not ever get it, so just be patient. If you're using the market internals, nothing's broken. It's just literally that there's an you know an odd moment in the markets right now. Uh, case in point, you know, Q's is is rejecting daily gap, uh, and you know, meanwhile, we've got the New York market. It's not really making new lows, and I think Spy is doing similar. We we've just had so many times where I mean, heck, the New York market was starting to make new highs at the end of the day, and the Q was making new lows. I think that was this day, yeah. That was uh, Jan 25th, so last Thursday. This There's a handful of divergences. I'm still not even sure what's uh, what has been pumping the volume. So we had many days this month thus far where the New York volume is tanking, completely bearish. One, two, three, four. Uh, we had a V day that day. I mean, we had tons of these. And... Then we got these insane bullish days 
this one, this is a good case right here. So here's the 25th. I'll, I'll pick on that. And here's the 25th on add. So the price, uh, we opened up with the you know, majority advancement, like 1800 something. And we actually lose 1500 and come down. Spies definitely feeling it. But then do start to ascend, but nothing like, nothing like what the volume would indicate here by, by 106. We're breaking into that extreme bullish area and really taking it for a ride all the way up until the end of the day. It never stopped. One of the things I wanted to address when I make this video, uh, this first one here uh, for, for 24, is to have that situational awareness with the internals. Sometimes it's not a great time to trade. Sometimes they're misaligned so bad that you can't rely on some of the other indicators of MIT uh, to grab trades. So barring that, heading into this next week, like I said, we have earnings. And one thing, we were almost at the end of this month. We've passed uh, OPEX and we're still flying quite high. So monthly TWAP wise, the New York market is, you know, crested into the third deviation area, but we've come back down a little bit. SPY, I want to say SPY was very similar. Yeah, SPY's done pretty well. There was a day a couple weeks ago, I think, where we actually ripped over the third deviation. And that was wild. I think that was on a gap day. Russ is the weakest one thus far. It's It's not been smooth sailing for Russ. If we look at it uh, kind of on the full screen here, we can look at it and it's it's Chop City. So I think we hit 200 and we have not come back. And so far, I think it's mainly just driven by, uh, by economics. And, you know, small caps are going to be the ones that have a, a little bit more volatility. Interestingly, though, they're not really hanging with the New York market like they were last year, where I was pretty convinced that the New York market and the Russ were largely overlapping to the point where the New York market would kind of dictate what Russ was going to do. And I've just not been seeing that here lately. Caution to be exerted. And uh, the other thing is, is the monthly TWAPs are cresting up. We have a very wide range at this point, And we actually did kind of have a squeeze here for a little bit. So it was a little bit interesting. But you can see after last week, we had difficulty the first couple days. We had this massive gap on Wednesday. We lose previous day's range, uh, or the high rather. And then the next day, of course, we had this huge range, so we just chopped within it. But then Friday, we finished with a new high for the, the entire New York market. So that's, that's pretty bullish. SPY, not so much. We did make a new high. <clears throat> um and broke out over previous day high, but we closed back within. So lots of tight days where we're inside these really tight ranges. Um, it's going to be very interesting to, to see how the rest of the month plays out. I would not be surprised to see some volatility come into the markets and then maybe push us back down. I think when we had this move up, we, we had quite a large move, and it was another fast move. So we did fill in some area here, but we're far extended from the 5 and the 20. And you can see all the, the wicks and the hesitation here. We're cooking hot on the RSI across all the different spiders. I'm starting to see energy specifically. That's the green line here coming up. It's crested over 50 at this point. And I'm starting to see some of the other ones, utilities, materials. You know, They're all kind of coming up as well. Also, I'm not seeing high volume on a lot of these spy days. So this last one was 76 mil. It is over the average, but it's not like what we have seen on some of these other days where we've really pushed price. So we had a couple of days here that we really pushed price. And if, if memory serves, the, the volume was not substantial. Heading over to one of the newer studies that I have put together, Market Average Trend. I have put this out there, published under my account on uh, TradingView. Feel free to check it out. I I strongly encourage it if you're somebody that likes to take a look from a high uh, you know, bird's eye view, from a high standpoint, and just kind of get a gauge for maybe what the market will be doing coming into the week or even just the next day. I will warn you, this study makes use of feed data that is only updated at the end of the day. It can repaint, meaning if you have this up during the day, you look at it even 
after the bell rings, it's going to say one thing. And then like 6, 7 p.m. Eastern time, I've noticed all of a sudden, if I refresh my chart, the values are different. Please be mindful of that. I'm not promising exact values. These aren't my feeds. I merely am just presenting them kind of in a consolidated manner that allows me to have them on charts like the one I'm sharing with you right now. So, uh, so yeah, this one here is tracking just the SPY S&P 500. And what it's doing is it's providing a, an in-depth look at the different market internals that track percentages of stocks over the different moving averages. So 20, 50, 100, 200. They have 150 in there and I don't have it enabled. The five is a little too noisy uh, for my liking, but we can turn it on here for a moment. Okay, so there's the noise. <laughs> but looking at it though, right, you can see a couple of moments here. This in the past, just in the past recent history, where the 5 SMA specifically, this one here, has actually done a fantastic job. And I call it RSI, but it's uh, that is kind of how I use it. It's called bottoms really well. Obviously, nothing is perfect. Um, but looking at this, we had one on uh, December 20th, another one Jan 4, and then the last one here was Jan 17th. So I look at these all the time. I have a different chart uh, where I have same upper study here for SPY, but I'm focusing in more on the top holdings of the major indices. So the SPY 100, NASDAQ 100, the Dow Industrial, and the Russell 1000. Uh, I'm going to hide the RSI here for a moment because I've already looked at that on the other chart. But the one thing that hopefully stands out is, for the most part, there is a lot of synchronous movement. We have the same similar dips. So I've got the 5, the 50, and the 200. So I get that long time trend. I get the interim, and then I have the, the immediate trend. So that's what's on all of these. And you can you can see their values over here. So going back to this, they're, they're moving mostly in sync, save for here recently. So we had a dip, and I was kind of expecting us to come a little lower on the 24th. That's when I called a potential high for the week, and we, we bounced it instead. But notice the one that's having more issues here is NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ 100 holdings are somewhat continuing to come down, but we're not really seeing that here on SPY. Now, if I change this over to Q's, we're going to see something a little different that, that is more closely aligned to what we're seeing down here, where we've got three down days. Now, granted, we're still up, but it's something it's something to note. So going back to SPY, see we had a down day, an up day, and then you know definitely obviously a down day but very tight so we're seeing that divergence in the main indices with all the different holdings uh but we're we're seeing something a little different here when we focus in just on those top holdings so i'm going to be watching that we also see the dow is showing us kind of the same thing i'll be from a higher vantage point all the other longer term averages are showing us that the majority of stocks the majority of holdings 77 percent in the case of nasdaq are still above the 200, 76% <clears throat> are still above the 50. It's only the five that we've hit kind of an interesting area where only 50% of stocks are above their five day average. So these all use the closing prices. So about half the stocks have pulled back compared to their average prices from you know the last week now at, in this case because we've we're reviewing this on the weekend before the next week starts where do we come back to you know i don't know for spy though 481 <laughs> maybe uh we can drag this 10 up more before we touch it we might not come back at all it really depends on many things outside of any information pretty much anybody has one thing to to look at though is I mentioned that energy is starting to see a rise. When you see that, a lot of times you will see that it's a kind of a defensive move. And looking at this, so I've got a little bit of a different indicator set up on here. Um, it's this double stotch RSI. Very, uh, very neat little study I've been doing with that one. But the range here is previous day high and the purple line is previous day low. Looking at these different stocks. Um, so Zom, if I can find it here, so Exxon Mobil, they've just had a tremendous week. 
Tuesday, ripping over previous high. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I mean, it really did not slow down at all. And a lot of these other stocks, Chevron, same thing. Uh, ConocoPhillips. It's just, you know, big moves. Schlumberger is another one. Phillips 66. Marathon. So all these are moving pretty well. The next sector that I have been keeping my eye on is um, is the utilities, XLU. Starting to see some of those pick up as well. Not nearly as heavy, so I don't know if these are going to continue next week or or what, but you know, maybe another rotational kind of move in there. Uh, one thing I wanted to pull up was another indicator that I put together. And this one here looks at the live range for a particular anchored period and plots it over the candles. So in this case, this is the ES hourly chart, and I have the range anchored to the monthly time frame. So that means when the new month starts, that's when it starts building out the new range. And in this case, this is, you know, the first month of the year. So this is also kind of the yearly range, at least until we flip to February. And in this case, you can see the opening price is uh, pretty much right where the mid of the range is from the low and the high that has been printed so far this month. So that's kind of fascinating to me when I see that kind of alignment, 48.14. And then we have a couple levels here. You don't have to have all these on. Let me turn all these, a lot of these off for, for the moment. But the big things, if you've watched my channel for any time, you know I love the 50% measurement of all kinds of things. So this midline here is, as it's titled, the mid. That's 50% of the, the living range, the dynamic range. And then we've got a 50% line between the high, the current high, and the, the current middle range level. And also the... 50% for the low and the, the mid of the range. And it's a study I've been doing um, not for not too long here as far as with this indicator, but looking at this, I feel it gives me a, a much broader perspective of where the developed range may take us. And if we're going to revisit any areas, what would be most probable? 50% tests, for whatever reason, are you know really common. You can see even as recent as Jan 17, we bounced the mid at the time, the mid of the, the range as it was back then. And we bounced, we had a perfect wick retest off of that and you know away we went. So this is a very effective measure thus far from what I have seen. Even the clustering here around the open price, pretty important level there to keep an eye on. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the open and mid have aligned at this point. Looking at this, though, I said Wednesday I had expected us to make the high, and that was it. And I had these little magnets here because I had anticipated us coming down and taking a look at these from, you know, from the market standpoint. And I was surprised, you know, we have not done so yet. So another interesting measurement that's coming out of this indicator is these really flat lines. So when the range doesn't make any new high or low, it's just drawing that existing high over across the price. And it just so happens that what comes out of this is that that's actually somewhat of a support and or resistance area, a key level, if you will. So you can kind of pull that out. So the more time was spent under that, that's the more important, important that becomes. And I think that's why when we came up here, we pushed on that and just barely knocked it up, but it's overall still roughly that same area. And then notice here, we had stretched this out for about a day and a half. Not that much time, yeah. Day and seven hours. And we bounced it all day Wednesday at the lows here in pre-market. And then we bounced it again Friday before we came up to make a slightly higher high. And then now here in, in the current overnight uh, extended hours market, you know, we're sitting just uh, slightly above it. So very effective. But if we do see some downside from JPOW or whatever else, I'm going to keep the 4876 level in mind as well as the 4818. And those are floating. Obviously, you can see this level has already adjusted some. 
uh, given Friday's movement. Uh, another one to look at is the weekly range. So the week is done now, and I was anticipating that with those magnets, you know, the the lowest one or the highest one on the monthly was the lowest range level on ES. If I'm not mistaken, yes, uh, it was somewhere around here. So that kind of gave me a target potentially to look for, and we obviously did not hit that. And look at how where we bounced Friday in uh, early pre-market session was right on the mid of the developing uh, weekly range. Same thing here for Thursday as you know, intra the pre-market and intraday on the regular trading hours uh, session. So very fascinating indicator. Highly recommend you check it out. It's uh, anchored progressive range. Um, so that week's done though. We started a new uh, new week. Uh, so again, I'm going to come back to the monthly levels, and these are going to be the ones that I'm going to look at uh, as potential targets if we do see some downside. So overall, um, that's kind of it for everything. We've got VIX at 13, and you know some pretty crazy New York volume days, and even some better advancement days, but so far a lot of you know, constricted movements. One a filter kind of rule that I have for myself, I'm pretty sure I've called it out before, but I'm going to go ahead and, and just call it out again um, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, I'll leave TWAP on, but so this other indicator here is my TWAP ranges indicator, and all it does is it plots the prior day's TWAP ranges as they ended over the next day's price so you can see the first deviation here this kind of pink zone that perfectly lines up with friday's twop first standard deviation range as it ended projected over and i have a rule that i've been using and it's really uh, been quite effective at helping me stay out of low quality trades and that is very simply if it doesn't jump right out at you is if price is above prior day's first standard deviation range, that's a bullish day, okay? If it's below the prior day's first standard deviation range, so like on this day here, Tuesday, then that is a bearish day, okay? So I am going to hide TWAP here for a moment. There is a little bit additional nuance to this, but... What I've been doing is I wait <clears throat> if there's a gap down day like this one, I wait to see, are we going to consolidate around any of these range levels? Otherwise, I wait until we come and test at least the low of this range. And then I just use standard price action kind of reading, looking for breaks such as this one, and then a retest. So this one, a little scary, you know, we, get, we do get a break and retest, but this candle here is so wide and long it's not one you want to jump into. Wait for, for something a little bit more clear, which we get somewhere around here. But look at the cluster of wicks right around previous TWAP. So perfect trade here. Grab your two SDs and get, get out for the day. Another day here. We gap down. Okay, you're, you're way down here. You don't short so far from where the market was the prior day. You know, don't short a potential bottom. And look, you know, if you had shorted this, you would have had a drawdown of about a dollar. You know, depending on how you trade, that could really hurt, especially options, because not only is it a dollar drawdown, it's two hours of theta decay, depending on what contracts you're using. But look at this clustering here. And then we have this very nice clean break right back below. You could even wait for the retest and get in there. And then if you've got your additional range projections on, look at that. You can get your two SDs and get out, right? So this is just a, a trading style that I have adopted. It's a very good filtering rule for me. Helps me not have to address trying to create a bias based off of a whole lot of different things and maybe subjecting to various uh, bias adjustments intraday based on whatever. So here's another perfect day. We gap up, wait for the test back into the prior day's TWAP ranges. We finally get it. Right around here, you know, maybe you had some fake outs here, but you get another good clean retest and away you go. 
obviously definitely more than two SDs delivered. This day, we're in the range, and we have a couple of breakouts, finally a nice trending day. But look, every time over the prior first standard deviation range, bullish day. Under, bearish day. It's a very clean filter this day. Look at that. Now, here's another day. We're inside the range, and you know you probably end up scalping the range, or if you try to go... Uh, you know, hit a home run for bullish trades. Maybe this is a losing day, but it's going to be something that you're knocking out 50% of your losses because you're not trying to go short and long in the same day. We're over the prior day range, so you're just trying some longs. And if anything, you, know, you might have grabbed a couple of good longs out of this, or you know, maybe maybe you didn't, and maybe you lost a little money. But it's better than when you're trying to guess which direction every 15 minutes here's another day when we're inside the first standard deviation range that's a good day to sit and wait wait for some clarity wait for a good breakout and take your trade so you had a couple of short opportunities here nothing really fantastic um, if you're really good at reading MIT and, and the other indicators you know, you might have been able to scalp this, but this is short under, long uh, over. So here's another day where if you're following the rule, maybe you don't have as much fun because you're not grabbing, uh, you're not grabbing any of this downside that we had. But if you've got additional range projections, you should have at least been able to grab some of the upside. Another day where we're inside, and this is really choppy. You don't want to be trading this kind of garbage. Maybe some of these moves, but even like if you shorted here somehow for some reason, you got some pretty nasty whipsaws back up against you. So anyways, I wanted to share that rule with you. I don't know if I've shared it before, but even if I had, not everybody watches all the videos. So I felt it's important enough to cover. All right, so I've covered quite a lot um, coming into this week. I'm not going to expect a whole lot of movement with with regards to the intraday trades on SPY and Qs. I, obviously, they're going to be making moves, but I think with the economic information upcoming, as well as the big tech earnings, I think we're going to see gaps. I think we're going to see weird theta decay squeeze type days, and we're going to see potentially some erratic movements um, with VIX where it's at. We could see some pretty aggressive pops. We had one last week on Wednesday. We hit a low of almost 12 and a half, and we rejected 14 and we're back around 13 and we were just mid uh, January up in 15 land and we brought it all the way back down so where we're at now you know if you're an options seller you might you might want to be a little more careful exercise a little bit more caution if you're a uh, options buyer you might like this a little bit more but watch out for any kind of strong whipsaws and uh, I would say also, you know, recommend you taking a look at this spider tracker indicator, which I put together. And what I'm doing right now to kind of challenge myself when the indexes are acting funky is I go and look at some of the stocks within the different sectors, some of the top holdings, and uh, I'm going to try trading some of those. See if there's some opportunities as they're starting to rise. Perhaps there's a defensive maneuver against uh, some of the tech drawdown that I was uh, pushing, uh, pointing out here. So... All right, so this wraps it up, and like I said, I'm not going to be creating daily or every other day market internal review videos, so you can consider this the one for the week. I will be publishing some additional content for some of these indicators. I've had some requests to create indica um, indicator videos for MIT, some more in-depth how to use it intraday kind of uh, videos, so this will free up my time to make some uh, make some of those videos and address some of those requests. So hope you found this useful. Like I said earlier in the beginning of this long video, please feel free to leave comments down uh, below for suggestion. And as always, thank you for watching. Happy trading.